Chapter 512 Strange Pirate Ship Lumion watched Philip's retreating figure disappear into the distance, a silent chuckle escaping his lips. This guy was competent, he had to admit. Gone was the frivolous, greasy, and undisciplined facade he'd displayed at the bar the night before. It was a common trait among many intigent men, Lumion observed. When not engaged in demanding work and surrounded by attractive women, they turned into preening peacocks, desperate to display their prowess. Becoming a beyonder didn't change that fundamental nature. Demonesses thrived in Intus, especially in Treyar. This wasn't just due to the city's underground allure. There was a deeper, more harmonious connection with the society at large. Lumion wasn't offended by Philip's warning, nor did he take it personally. He'd planned to enjoy the voyage over the next few days, even considered lending a hand in maintaining order on the ship, becoming a shadow inquisitor of sorts. But now, his primary concern shifted to how Philip had unmasked their true identities. Lumion had meticulously combed through Aurora's grimoire, studying the abilities of low-sequence beyonders across 22 pathways, and supplemented his knowledge with information gleaned from various sources over the past months. From this, he formed the preliminary hypothesis. Philip is likely a beyonder of one of three pathways. Spectator, reader, or arbiter. One excels at observing minute details and reading people's true thoughts. Another is a master of deduction, their sequence 7 even being called detective. They can detect abnormalities from the most subtle clues. The third, at sequence 8, public security officer, wields extraordinary control within their jurisdiction, allowing them to sense and trace anomalies. Given that we haven't spoken directly with Philip before, I can eliminate the spectator option. Besides, spectators aren't typically chosen as security supervisors. It's not their forte. After discovering that there was a problem with us through his abilities and that our origins were unclear, Philip likely checked copies of our identification and sent telegrams to the issuing authorities and he received confirmation that these three people didn't exist. This explains the delay in his warning. He'd waited for the investigation and response before making his move. This also implies he has a network of helpers across different regions, receives information and feedback, and possesses extensive connections. Doing this alone wouldn't be possible. He has an organization backing him. Something more official, perhaps. He did claim to be a retired officer of the Fog Sea Fleet, after all. Such a person is indeed well suited to lead the security on a heavily armed merchant ship like this. Lumion turned away and closed the door, a wave of relief washing over him. With such a capable security supervisor at the helm, issuing discreet warnings to potential threats, the journey ahead promised to be relatively safe. Lumion spent the morning in the comfort of his first-class cabin, Cabin 5, indulging in a leisurely study of Highlander and breaking up his reading with bouts of exercise. Meanwhile, Ludwig, after breakfast, had begged Lugano to take him on a tour of the ship, spending over an hour on deck playing like a genuine child. Lumion, however, suspected the true purpose of this excursion was to meticulously survey the location and condition of the ship's food reserves. Before lunch, Drawn by the bright sun, Lumion descended to the deck. He rested his hands on the railing and gazed out at the vast, dark blue expanse of the sea. From the corner of his eye, he caught sight of Philip, back to his usual casual demeanor. He was now entangled with the girl from the previous night at the bow of the ship, whispering sweet nothings and laughing. The picture of a smitten couple. You and Tijans. Lumion shook his head with a chuckle. After leaving Treyar, he had adjusted his usual phrases to better reflect reality. Philip and the girl continued their stroll along the deck, their laughter echoing through the air. With the enhanced hearing of a hunter, Lumion had no trouble making out the girl's name. Gazia. Though not conventionally beautiful, she exuded a youthful vibrancy that was undeniable. Lumion watched as Philip's gaze darted beyond the ship's railing his face hardening for a brief moment. Following the security supervisor's line of sight, Lumion scanned the horizon, 
spotting a colossal shadow lurking beneath the undulating waves. It disappeared as quickly as it appeared, swallowed by the surging sea. Smaller than the flying bird, but far larger than any sea creature. Giant fish, or something more? Lumian mused, a spark of excitement igniting within him. My dear, what has captured your attention? Gazia's voice broke through Philip's reverie. My sweetheart, just thinking about which first-class restaurant I'll treat you to later. Philip replied nonchalantly. Suddenly, a thin veil of fog crept upwards from the sea, obscuring the sun and dimming the surrounding environment. The passengers and crew on deck remained unfazed, accustomed to such sudden weather changes in the fog sea. Although less intense than the Berserk Sea, the unpredictable nature of the region was ever-present. As Gazia reveled in the first foggy day of their journey, Philip discreetly raised his right arm, gesturing towards the spot where the shadow had vanished. He doesn't think it's a passing giant fish. Lumian admired the sea ahead with interest. He noticed several crew members ending their breaks and taking their positions, including the gunners. The peaceful atmosphere was shattered by a loud splash as a monstrous iron-black behemoth surfaced from the depths. It was a peculiar-looking ship. It was covered in a layer of metal, with only thin pipes resembling snail eyes protruding from its hull. As sea water cascaded off its sides, the upper half of the strange vessel split open, revealing a fearsome array of cannons and masts rising from within, creating a wide deck. Dozens, perhaps even hundreds of pirates armed with firearms and swords were on the deck, filling the air with their intimidating cries. A white sail unfurled automatically, right to the top of the mast. Wow, Lumian marveled inwardly. He had never seen such a magical vessel before, a vessel that could disappear and reappear from the depths of the sea. Philip's expression grew increasingly grave. Beside him, Gazia froze, her eyes wide with terror as she instinctively huddled closer to her lover. Which pirate crew is this? Only one man commands such undersea vessels. Philip replied, his voice devoid of its usual frivolity and heavy with grim certainty. Admiral Deep Sea, Hal Constantine. Judging by the size of this vessel, it's not his flagship, the new ones. It's the Black Octopus, commanded by his most trusted subordinate, Bone Splitter Basil. Gazia's vision swam, and she nearly fainted. The night before, during their conversation, Philip had mentioned the infamous maritime kings and pirate admirals who ruled the five seas. Among them, Hal Constantine, who had recently risen to the rank of admiral, was shrouded in mystery. Legend whispered of his monstrous heritage, claiming he possessed the blood of sea monsters. He had even ventured into the ruins of a sunken city, recovering the relics of ancient alchemists, two stealth boats capable of navigating the depths of the ocean unseen. Inspired by these vessels, the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery had attempted to develop their own undersea fleet. However, they failed to mass-produce them. Due to the reliance on higher sequence beyonders, only one or two of these vessels could be assigned to each incision fleet, each serving specialized functions. Of Admiral Deep Sea's two undersea vessels, the first, the new ones, was a behemoth rivaling the flying bird in size. Inspired by a renowned maritime treasure legend, it served as Hal Constantine's flagship. The second, the Black Octopus, which had just emerged from the depths, was entrusted to his most trusted subordinate, Bone Splitter Basil. He was an equally formidable figure known for his cold-blooded brutality and ruthless tactics. He took pleasure in torturing his captives, and the bounty on his head, far exceeding that of most non-admiral pirates, stood at a staggering 250,000 Vrodal. The revelation of the Black Octopus and Bone Splitter Basil plunged Gazia into a pit of despair. How could a mere armed merchant ship like the Flying Bird possibly stand against such notorious pirates from the Five Seas? What horrors awaited them under Bone Splitter Basil's reign of terror? Philip, however, had no time for his new lover's distress. His full attention was focused on the unfolding spectacle of the Black Octopus and its menacing cannons, 
ready to unleash their fury at any moment. Standing a short distance away, Lumion felt a thrill coursing through his veins when he heard the name Bone Splitter Basil, the strongest subordinate to Admiral Deep Sea Howe Constantine. This was not nervousness, but the exhilarating feeling from catching a whiff of iron and blood. This was one of the hunter's belligerents. Even after fully digesting the potions, a Beyonder would still be affected by them. Lumion's emerald eyes, sharp as an eagle's, locked onto the bizarre iron black ship as he formulated his next move. Once Bone Splitter Basil emerged and the two vessels closed the distance, Lumion planned to teleport behind the infamous pirates and unleash the spell of Harumph. If the spell of Harumph's effect proved insufficient and failed to incapacitate Basil, Lumion would don his flogged boxing gloves, instill a specific desire within his opponent, and teleport again, creating greater distance before activating the Symphony of Hatred, amplifying the instilled desire to a maddening degree. With Bone Splitter Basil severely wounded and momentarily incapacitated, Lumion would seize the opportunity to unleash his full hunter arsenal, striking the enemy down with devastating blows. To prevent interference from the surrounding pirates, he could potentially create a bottle of fiction and isolate Bone Splitter Basil for a one on one duel. A complex plan, complete with contingency measures, raced through Lumion's mind, causing a slight tremor in his body, as if anticipating the thrill of the coming battle. Just as the tension reached a peak and a naval confrontation seemed imminent, the pirates aboard the Black Octopus turned as one, their eyes fixed in shock upon the stairs leading deeper into the vessel. A few seconds later, the bizarre iron black ship made an abrupt turn, altering its course and steering away from the flying bird. With swift precision, the exposed sections of the black octopus retracted, sealing its interior once more. In the eyes of Lumion and the others, the black octopus rapidly distanced itself, diving back into the depths of the foggy sea. In the blink of an eye, it transformed into a mere shadow, disappearing completely. E escaped? Uttering the word after a long moment of dazed silence, Gazia turned to her lover, her voice filled with surprise and confusion. Bone Splitter Basil and his black octopus were simply leaving? Without a fight? Without plundering? Philip, himself bewildered, stared at the spot where the black octopus had vanished, forcing a smile onto his face. Didn't I tell you that I know many great pirates?